Okay, now we're on to a little movie called Jackie Brown, which came out a few years after Pulp Fiction. It was, it was his follow-up to that movie. So a lot of people were excited uh, to see what he would do next. Uh, and uh, he, ma he made us wait uh, at least a few years. And then I remember the lead-up to this, everyone was excited. The soundtrack came out ahead of the film. And everybody bought it, and everybody was listening to it, trying to guess where the songs would fit in, and what the scenes would be, and what the context is. It was a very mysterious soundtrack, you know, in in that. It's like, oh, how does this work? There was a, um, a hip-hop song, The Firm, and there was some uh, movie music, and there was some... There was more country music, and there was more soul music. There was a lot more soul this time. There was no surf music, but uh, I remember the one modern hip-hop song that was in the soundtrack wound up just being played while Max Cherry was was looking for the Delphonic CD in the in a record shop it was just like on in uh, on the speakers in, in the record store and then there was the movie music i can't remember what it was called it was very just like movie-esque and that wound up just play, being played as Max Cherry walked out of the theater for the movie he just watched it was like the end credits song from a, from some movie he saw so a lot of people guessed wrong in terms of that, but um, and a lot of people were expecting Pulp Fiction Part Two, I think, and uh, mistakenly so because this movie is not that. This this movie is more of a character study and more uh, more of a love film slash heist film. It's another heist film like Reservoir Dogs was, only this time you see the heist in uh, in all its glory. Um, you even see it in Pulp Fiction. Uh, uh, butchered narrative style of the, the uh, playing with the structure where where you see the the heist multiple times from different perspectives from the perspectives of the different characters involved in the heist it's a great sequence so the spirit of pulp fiction is there the spirit of reservoir dogs is there but it is very much its own beast it has it uh uh tarantino's voice but it is a little bit more naturalistic and um, muted this time around. Not muted, but yeah, you just like it's just more. It's more natural. It's more down to earth, but uh, still heightened. Um, Sam, especially in the Sam, with the Sam Jackson character, um, he has some colorful lines of dialogue that he delivers in only the way that Sam Jackson can deliver a Tarantino line. His character of Ordell. This is definitely for me the movie that cemented him as a serious talent as an actor when you put Jules and Ordell next to each other even though they're both reciting that colorful Tarantino dialogue you can see the differences in the two to me I prefer his performance in Jackie Brown even though um, his his role as Jules in, in Pulp Fiction was deemed more Oscar worthy but uh, Ordell is uh, and is completely different than Jules um, they are both criminals they are both cold-blooded to a to a sense, in in a sense, to a point. But um, Ordell is definitely more of a uh, piece of shit, <laughs> let's say, than than Jules is. Um, but and the look is different. He has he's sporting the long hair and the and the uh, I don't even call that like a, some sort of a ponytail goatee thing, whatever it is. His facial hair is very uh, <laughs> interesting in that movie. Um, Still very quotable, not as not as quotable, not as it didn't it didn't catch on in the in the way that uh, that Pulp Fiction did. In fact, it was I wouldn't say panned, but it left a lot of people with a question mark on their on their heads and as to huh, I'm not sure what I how I feel about this guy now. And I think it really did kind of root out the uh, the Tarantino fans from the fans of something very specific that Tarantino could give them. This was a different time. This is when Tarantino was synonymous with like natural born killers and true romance. That whole Tarantino exploitation subgenre that uh, Pulp Fiction had created had also uh, given him a kind of name and style that was uh, perhaps a little premature. So then, when people saw this movie, and this movie was a mature, was more of a, uh, a mature character piece. Now it's a it's a genre film. It's a, it's a crime picture, but it definitely was more of a ty the type of a film that an older director might tackle in the way that he tackles the subject matter. People were just not expecting that. It was adapted from an Elmore Leonard novel. This is the only film that uh, Tarantino has made that's an adaptation of another work. 
That's why he's on the record as saying, if this is your favorite movie, then you're not a fan of mine or whatever he said. Uh, what, um, if you were going to assess a person who's, uh, what would you think of a person whose favorite film of yours was Jackie Brown? What does that mean about that person? What does that mean? Okay, uh, if I'm going to be snotty, I'm like, oh, sure, it means sure. you don't like my movies, and that's the one <laughs> that's like the, the least like my movie, so that's the one you like. These like harsh, uh, not harsh, yeah, just like matter of fact kind of blunt statements of just like, hey, this is the way it is and everything. Because a lot of people did either really love the movie at the time, which is me. When I first saw the movie, it, it, had, it had immediately become my favorite Tarantino film. And you have other people who just reassess it later on and recognize that this was a serious work of art uh, and uh, and that it was just overlooked at the time. Like, again, it wasn't considered bad. It just had people scratching their heads. It had people a little concerned. It wasn't the slam bang out the gate that Tarantino needed to cement him as, you know, a mainstay and, and to give him the... Um, the longevity that he now has like to and to cement his rock star status as well that was that film was was uh was kill bill when kill bill came out because he finally had given the audience what they wanted which was just a balls to the walls exploitation film uh bloody and and uh animated and just heightened and just like that movie is closer to something like a natural born killers than it is definitely something like Jackie Brown. It's even more crowd-pleasing in that way than Pulp Fiction is, which is also kind of uh, heightened. It's just, uh, Pulp Fiction is like, has that kind of comic book care, uh, quality to it, uh, in that it feels like it may exist in another world, where Jackie Brown is more grounded, it's more obviously of this world. And I think that's the Elmore Leonard of it all. But um, Jackie Brown is, is loaded with uh, amazing performances. He, ha he had attempted to resurrect the careers of Robert Forster and Pam Greer this time around, two of his favorite actors from the 70s. He did bring them back in a, in, a, in a way. He didn't bring them back in the way that he brought Travolta back, who then, after Pulp Fiction, kind of became a, a household name again. And he started doing big movies, and all of them went to theater uh, theaters, and it was... Uh, um, he was just a big star again. Uh, but then again, Travolta had already been that at one point. So Tarantino's powers only go so far. He can, he can resurrect a career of a star if they, uh, if they had, he could bring them back to the, to the point that they were when they fell. So Travolta was, was huge. So Tarantino brought him back up here. Huge. Pam Greer and Robert Forster, basically all he did for them is he got them working again. He got them working in genre films again. Pam Greer would go on to, I think she had done Mars Attacks, Tim Burton's Mars Attacks before this, I think. But um, she would go on to work with John Carpenter and Ghosts of Mars and a uh, few movies like that that went to the theater. But for the most part, she was still working, but she, was, she also did like the Fortress sequel. The direct-to-video Fortress sequel, the Christopher Lambert film. Uh, the, the originally the original film was directed by Stuart Gordon, and she played the bad guy in that. So she would pop up in this and that. So so she, he didn't do like amazing wonders for her career. And Robert Forster, though, he was just like in in everything and bits and pieces, which is funny because that's kind of what he was before. He was a character actor, and he would. He would rarely front and star in a film, but he would be like a part of an ensemble or he'd be like in a scene. And he just went on to keep doing that uh, to where he, he had he had dropped a bit and Tarantino brought him right back up to where he was. He Tarantino can never bring you higher than you were, but he can bring you back to where you were. And that's what he did for them. He works with uh, De Niro again for the first and potentially the last time in, in this film. Not because it was a bad experience. They enjoyed working with one another. This is another instance where an actor wanted a different role. Uh, De Niro had wanted to play Max Cherry, I believe. And um, Tarantino had said, hey, I promised that role to Robert Forrester. So he convinced him. Okay, I think he'd be really good for this. And, and he was right. This film uh, stuck with me musically more than any of his films have. It's my favorite of his soundtracks. Between Natural Hides, the Delphonic song that plays multiple times in the movie, it's basically the love theme between Max Cherry and Jackie Brown. 
because again, this is a love story. Uh, it's like a between two middle-aged people who find each other, and they're helping each other and working with the, one another in this uh, in this heist to screw over this uh, this guns dealer uh, played by Samuel L. Jackson, who is basic, who is the villain, I guess. If you had to pick a villain, there are a bunch of criminals in this movie, but he's the villain of the movie. There was, was also like a sweet side. <laughs> call it, I don't know if you'd call it a romance between uh, Sam Jackson and Bridget Fonda. It's not really a romance uh, at all, really. But it's uh, there is a moment when uh, spoiler alert. So when Lewis informs Ordell that he has shot uh, Melanie, uh, who is the Bridget Fonda character, his reaction to that probably the 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 closest that Ordell has ever come or will, would ever come to expressing his affection or love for somebody is just like just like he was so disappointed you know because he's like that was my little surfer girl or whatever but i I've, of course this has come from a place of ownership like he's collecting these women that he has in various houses but just just his disappointment i think that also has something to do a big part to do with him shooting lewis in that scene the 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 end of that scene that's just one of my favorite scenes in the movie of course I don't believe that he would have shot Lewis had Lewis not lost the money. So obviously Ordell shows, shows that he cares more about money than other people, than human life, than even his surfer girl, Melanie. But um, but it's just like, that's the icing on the cake. I, I, I feel like losing the money, oh no, okay, you're incompetent, what have you done? He, like He realizes Jackie Brown screwed him over. But then it's the... It's the fact. It's on. If he hadn't shot Melanie, if Melanie was there with them, he he uh, Lewis would still be alive. So it was a little bit more than just the incompetence of losing the money. It was just you killed my surfer girl. You lost my money. What happened to you, man? Your ass used to be beautiful. And in in, after he shoots him, I just love that scene. There's just so many shocking moments. Even in the, even the scene when Melanie is shot in the parking lot by Lewis is just like the way it's shot how he shoots her off camera you just hear her fall and then he just like he's like see I told you I knew where the car was or whatever he's like <laughs> and it's just like it's so insane and it's so shocking because she's, she's like getting on his nerves through that entire sequence little by little and then she just goes to she's just like so she's like whisp whispering in his ear Lewis Lou is, you know, in his ear, and he's just like, he's just like, keep it together, be it all, you know, cool, and just look, look for the car, and they just like out of nowhere, he's the, the the dude snaps, and he shoots her multiple times, and then she falls, and he shoots her again, and he somehow thinks that this is okay, uh, you know, um, he doesn't go into details <laughs> with Ordell uh, as far as. How it, how it went, so then Ordell's just like, by the end, he's like, okay, I guess if you had to do it, you had to do it. And then he's like, you, you couldn't have, you couldn't have hit her? He goes, ah, I don't know, maybe, but, uh, you know, you know, it's a terrible De Niro. <laughs> like, I don't know, I could, maybe I could have shot him, maybe I could have shot him, I don't know, you know, there's something like that. Now nah, that's even, that's even worse, maybe. But, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe I could have, but you weren't there, you know, you know, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> the, uh, that whole sequence. I mean, the heist, the scene in the van, uh, the end, how uh, the, the final double cross. Uh, Michael Keaton, again, I haven't talked about Michael Keaton. He has, a, he has a small role in this. And he plays the same role as he does in Out of Sight. It's the same character. They were shooting around the same time, so they thought it'd be fun. A fun idea to just bring Michael Keaton back in. Hey, play this dude. It's the same dude from the Elmore Leonard books. Because Elmore Leonard has this kind of Stephen King thing going on where a lot of his books are connected. Because it's all the same universe. A lot of authors do that. And and this is the case where these two the, these two adaptations, the Steven Soderbergh Out of Sight movie, which is one of my favorite movies. That's like, I love that movie so much. Another love story heist film. Uh, and... Um, and this movie are connected in that really, really sweet way uh, with Michael Keaton. It's a very small role, but um, uh, he's great in it. In the few scenes that he has, he he has he has the scenes he has are basically with um, with 
Pam Greer with Jackie Brown, and then he comes back in a big way at the end, and he uh, so it, and shows how truly important his character is through the whole and uh, the the whole story. Oh man, this movie, this movie is my favorite uh, uh, Tarantino film, without a doubt. Like uh, I'm not even gonna uh, play around. Uh, Jackie Brown, I'm one of those guys. I'm one of those lame people who says it's my favorite movie. So, Mr. Tarantino, I guess I'm not a Tarantino fan because I am picking Jackie Brown over Pulp Fiction. So sorry. So sorry! Thank you so much for your time. I hope you enjoyed the video. I love you very much. And uh, I hope that you have a, a, a wonderful day. Uh, goodbye. You feel from the sky Caught you making circles in the field last night I didn't ask why But Ellie and Joe seem to travel like